Marshlands can be deadly and swallow lives. But they are also the origin and beginning of life. A hidden bog at the German-Czech border is where Bohemia's lifeline originates, the Valtava. Over thousands of years, it has been meandering across meadows and forests, flowing especially rough and wild during spring and after rainfalls. The name is believed to originate from the old Germanic words, Wild Ava, meaning wild water. The river and its golden brown colored moor water is also home to a great diversity of wildlife and plants. And it has always been an inspiration for architects and artists. The highlight of the river's journey is when it reaches the city with the golden towers, Prague. The Valtavar is rich in nature and rich in history. It is in every respect a golden river. The cold Valtavar originates from a marsh in eastern Bavaria. The warm Valtavar has its source in the Czech Republic and is still hidden under ice and snow in March. Only later will both streams unify into a single current, the Valtava. In April, winter is coming to an end at the cold Valtava. Many of the river's companions, both large and small, return from their wintering ground. Like the mallard ducks who spent the cold season further south. The swans, on the other hand, stayed where they are and have found themselves some ice-free areas. just like the great cormorant, whose hunting attempts can't be hindered by the cold water. Underneath the frozen water, animals hibernate. Fish are the first to become active again. The otter also went on the prowl in winter and maintained its air holes in the ice. Hibernating creatures are its victims. Frogs, for example, oversleep the cold months at the bottom of slowly flowing or stagnant waters. The otter tracks them down and peels the skin off its helpless prey before eating. Foxes use a different technique head first into the mouse hole. They catch their prey, bite it to death and swallow it whole, fur included. The cold and warm Valdivar still haven't joined. They both flow downstream independently from each other. Now in spring, when the snow starts to melt, the cold Valdivar floods the bog. A slight increase in temperature already puts some animals in the mood for love. Frogs are the loudest when they mate. Toads are the most brutal. What looks like a lump will eventually create offspring. Quite a few toads are already thoroughly exhausted. After successfully mating, it's back to the woods. Surrounding brooks feed the two head water streams of the Valtava. 
In this way, they become stronger and stronger. One tributary to the cold Valdavar flows through Volari. This little town has a great history. A long time ago, a trade route led through Volari. People from Tyrol and Styria traded precious salt. They liked this place so much that they decided to stay. That was 600 years ago. Some of the old houses still exist today. They are built in the Alpine style, which is quite unusual for this region. In the middle of Volary, under this pile of wood, a hoopoe is nesting. What a perfect place. It is warm and dry, and the surrounding meadows are full of insects and larvae by now. This bit is not for him, though. It's for the nearly-fledged youngster in tow. The beech forests around Volary have taken on this dazzling green colour. They're a perfect hiding place for the green woodpecker, despite its red crown. Being an ant specialist, it returns to its offspring with a beak full of ants each time. Its nickname is Zorro, because of the black mask which runs from the beak until behind the bird's eyes. Meltwater from the nearby mountains collects in small lakes in the middle of the forest. From there, it flows off into the bog carrying humic acids with it. The water, now dark and yellow like heavy gold, finally flows into the tributaries of the Valdava. Here in the middle of the swampland, just behind the little town of Volary, lies the birthplace of the River of Gold. This is the place where the cold and the warm Valdivar become one. From here, there are 400 kilometers left until the Valdivar's journey will end as it joins together with the Elba. Moose have returned to Shumava, a region at the upper course of the Valdivar. Bogs are an ideal habitat for moose. Sinking into the soft ground is no disadvantage at all. Quite the contrary. With such a short neck, grazing on even ground is quite a challenge. Moose cows are dedicated mothers. They will usually have only one calf that stays with them for about a year. The ground beneath the tree is dry, an ideal resting place for the offspring. The bogs around the Valtavar are home to the marsh marigold, also known as gold of the meadows. Moose have little interest in the golden flowers. They only like to eat the leaves. The grass snake is also known as ringed snake due to the two yellow spots around its neck that form a collar. It's the end of April. As the water warms up, grass snakes also become active again. Led by their tongue, they're searching for frogs or toads. So far, nothing. Perhaps it must look on land. Trees growing in bogs can easily be blown down by the wind. The swampy forest doesn't look like a good habitat for a kingfisher at first. Starting from a rootstock, it flies towards the Valdava, a quick stop on the hunter's stand, before nosediving towards the ground. But catching fish is no easy task. It's a question of technique. Next try. 
With a bit of luck and practice, success may come. The fish isn't so keen about ending up as food. A strong blow against the branch might help. With the fish brought into position, it returns to the rootstock. Is it hiding something inside the fallen tree? Inside here, in a cosy burrow, is where the kingfisher hides its fledgling offspring. What a wise decision. Now it is becoming clear why the fish was transported head first. It's much easier to swallow it in the direction of its scales. On to the next hunt. There are more hungry youngsters to be fed. Beavers like both standing and running water. Inside this lodge, there is offspring as well. The young demand fresh greens. The branches are delivered through the underwater entrance straight into the living room. In beaver families, all members take part in raising the youngsters. The food is safely anchored and stored in a bay in order to protect it against currents and thieves. Whenever it is necessary, it's taken out of this pantry. Beaver lodges are huge constructions made of branches and woods. They can be up to 12 meters wide and two meters high. Several generations live under one roof. The oldest female sets the tone because beavers live in matriarchies. These large predators are still a rare species in the Shumavar. A male wolf is wandering alone through the forest. His nose picked up a scent. He only has to spot the prey. There it is. Two young roebucks are dueling on a clearing in the forest. Their inattentiveness is his opportunity. It's too late. Here in the bog, the Valdemar with its golden brown water is still a free and untamed river. It winds through the landscape, spreads out and softens the ground. Small, calm oxbow lakes and ponds are formed. Young fish gather around here, but so do their enemies. Great aigrettes like to have their meal accompanied by a sip of finest river water. This young roebuck has lost his track. He is coming dangerously close to the reed belt at the river bank. A western marsh harrier has built its nest here. It's keeping an eye on the buck. Well hidden among the reeds, the bird has managed to raise its entire brood. Marsh harriers only lay one clutch of eggs per year. These youngsters are almost ready to fledge. They must survive, otherwise it would have been all for nothing. The young birds are already training their flight muscles, but before they will be able to fly, they must get rid of their fuzz. Until then, the parent birds feed them like there's no tomorrow. Birds, mice, basically all small mammals they can find. 
First, the female dissects the prey. Then she feeds it to her young, beak to beak. The youngsters take care of the rest themselves. Marsh harriers are kippers. They take their time to grow up. The parents must guard the nest over weeks to ensure that nobody comes too close to it. If a potential enemy does approach, the harrier sends out an alarm call. This buck is quite unimpressed. Something else is bothering him. Deer rut has begun and he better not run into an older buck. The young knows that fights over territory or females can get pretty uncomfortable at his age. He's decided to leave. The marsh harrier can now return and continue to hunt. She brings more mice, but this time there's no affectionate feeding. The young are fighting over the food. As always, it's the strongest who wins. After eating, it's time for some grooming. The birds must remove the itching fuzz in order to fly. These are the last few kilometers the river runs freely. People have tried to tame the river. They separated it by artificial dams and created huge reservoirs. From here, the Valtavar will flow towards its destiny in nine cascades. Lipno is the first of all reservoirs. It's also known as the South Bohemian Sea. Its basin is natural and ancient. It was formed 50 million years ago in the tertiary, when a rock barrier for some time blocked the route of the Valtavar, creating a large reservoir up here. 60 years ago, people built a dam again. That's when the Lipno Reservoir was born. 42 kilometers long, five kilometers wide. The ancient reservoir was just as big. The shores of Lake Lipno are calm and peaceful. Part of them are covered in reed. Coots are omnivores and usually also resident birds here. With temperatures rising over the recent years, most of them don't leave the lake site anymore. The Valtavar determines the climate and thus the animal and plant life. Europe's smallest tit has settled among the reed. The pendulum tit is a brilliant architect and construction engineer. Using spliced reed leaves and fluffy plant seeds, the male weaves a hanging nest high above the water within four weeks. A branch serves as an anchor. If glue is needed, he just plucks some spider webs from the reed. Almost finished. While the female is busy working on the interior, the male disappears. He must build a new nest for another partner. The European tree frog is a master of adaption. Its long, round disc fingers help it climb up trees. Our frog here is also climbing upwards looking for a hiding place. Its genius adaptation talent comes in very handy. 
the tree frog carries colored pigments in its skin. Those pigments can migrate within the cells. Depending on their location, the color of the frog can change from yellow to green to blue-gray. This color change only takes a few minutes. It can be caused by factors such as the condition of the ground, temperature, humidity and, of course, the animal's mood. This one's had enough. It needs a little cooling off. On the shores of Lake Libno, right between underwater roots, fish fry lies hidden. Predators like the northern pike have difficulty reaching it. But the fish predator is both hunter and hunted. It is being observed by a white-tailed eagle. The bright contour of the pike can easily be spotted from above. The eagle is flying in from behind. But the young bird lacks hunting experience, and so it loses the fish. What now? The level ground is not exactly the best place to eat. It must bring its prey to higher altitudes. But grabbing a slippery fish is anything but easy. Hungry rivals have also smelled the carcass. The magpie. The red kite but also the crow want their share. All of a sudden, a buzzard shows up and chases everyone away. First the gills. What a delicious starter. But then, an unwanted rival shows up. When it comes to their prey, buzzards don't play around. By spreading its wings, it shows off its dominance. After that, it's back to the pike. But the rival isn't giving up that easily. Again, it has lost. but it's still hungry and decides to go in for another round. The buzzard under attack has had enough. It spreads its wings and throws the intruder onto its back. The message is clear. A few mouthfuls later, it's time to move on. Although the opponent was defeated several times, its tenacity still paid off. At the reservoir, there's enough food for everyone. <whistles> Until here stretched the ancient Lipno, the natural lake dammed millions of years ago.
From now on, the golden brown water flows through its natural bed again. The river is now free and untamed like in the beginning. Finally, it can live up to its original name again, Vilt Ava, Wild Water. In summer, the scenery turns more colourful, as many kayakers join the Valtava along its path. The river offers one of the most beautiful kayaking areas in Central Europe, a multitude of natural fast-flowing sections, stunning rafting alleys and wear passages. A real adventure for the athletes. Passing this vea, the water starts to calm down again. The bed of the Valdava is now smooth and free of rocks. The river is not a wide stream yet. At this point, it's still a rather small waterway that gently meanders through meadows and forests. The river's path leads through sparsely populated regions with a lot of green shores. What appears to be an ordinary meadow turns out to be a vibrant universe the world of the European ground squirrel. Ground squirrels are herbivores. They feed on roots, tubers and green plant parts. But sometimes a worm or an insect will also do. Ground squirrels love to scuffle and play catch. Especially the youngsters are full of energy. The older animals cushion their apartment with grass strips. Ground squirrels have multiple burrows where they also sleep or give birth to their offspring. But nothing is more important than eating. After all, a moderate layer of fat helps them to get through the long winter. Meanwhile, the Valdava has turned into an impressive river. It is not suitable for navigation yet, but that gives it the opportunity to flow freely and wildly towards the city of Chesky Konrov. No bigger ship could fit through here anyways. The name Chesky Konrov refers to crooked meadow and describes the many twists the Valdava makes coursing through the town. The former salt trading port is a UNESCO World Heritage Site today. <laughs> Behind Chesky Krumlov, the Valdivar continues meandering towards the next city, Budweis. Meadows, pastures and little forests mark the shores. The Divchi Kamen Castle was constructed in 1349 by order of Emperor Charles IV. But not long after, at the beginning of the 16th century, the castle was abandoned. Since then, it has gradually turned into ruins, and nature has taken over. On the grounds, a kestrel couple is raising their young. The place is perfect, mice are abundant, and the absolute silence is soothing. Like most birds of prey, the kestrel parents are both involved in the breeding of their offspring. Again, the Valtava forms a gigantic loom. It dances through the landscape just like it did before in the bog of the Shumava. 
Downstream, the loops get bigger and bigger. Then it flows gently again for a while, straight ahead, crossing valleys and forests along the way. Finally, just behind Budweis, or also Cheska Budovica, Klubocka Castle appears. The castle has an eventful history. Originally built in early Gothic style, it was rebuilt in Renaissance style and later converted into a Baroque castle. In 1947, the Hlubocka Castle in Czech Hlubocka nad Vladovo became property of the Czech Republic. Today, one of the nine cascades of the Vltava and a marina mark the view from the castle. Shortly after the cascade, the Vltava flows in its natural riverbed again, heading towards Prague. Over hundreds of thousands of years, great amounts of alluvial sand were deposited in the floodplains and former riverbeds of the Vltava and its tributaries. Small green gems lie dormant here. Every now and then, but especially after rainfall or when a field has been freshly ploughed, they appear on the surface. That's when the Moldavite explorers set off. 15 million years ago, this gemstone was hurled to the banks of the Valtava. When a meteorite hit a landscape in western Bavaria, natural glass was formed. It was catapulted up to this region by the powerful impact of the collision from out of space. People named their precious glass Moldavit. It is today a much sought after gemstone that can be mostly found at the Valtava in South Bohemia. Overhangs and sandy banks are the kingfisher's preferred nesting ground. The dense vegetation make the fish believe they're safe, but the kingfisher sees them all. An attempted catch usually only takes a second. A short break to dry the feathers, and off it goes again. This couple has to provide for up to eight hungry chicks. Naturally, male and female kingfisher need to team up. First, it's passing over the prey to the female. She will distribute it in the nest, because he is quite busy. Kingfishers can be promiscuous. Some males are seeing two females at the same time. They're then flip-flopping back and forth between the two females and their respective offspring. These chunks are quite difficult to swallow. In extreme cases, the male and one of his female partners already start to build a new nest right around the corner. And that, although his offspring in the other nest hasn't even fledged, it is really a stressful time for male kingfishers. About 140 kilometers before Prague, the Valdava reaches Lake Orling, 68 kilometers long and up to 80 meters deep. This reservoir is the most important part of the Valdava cascade. For over 50 years, it has repeatedly put the river in its place. The reservoir and its veers are crucial to the Czech Republic's power supply. But not only that, they also regulate the river's water flow and thus protect the entire region from being flooded.
Today, Lake Orlik ranks among the most beautiful recreation sites of the Czech Republic. High up on a mountain, on the left bank of the Vltava, lies the majestic Orlik Castle. That also lends its name to the lake. The owners of the castle, the Schwarzenberg family, have settled peacocks in its park. It's impossible to imagine the castle without them. This peacock got all dressed up. Today's outfit, a ceremonial garment, perfect to show off his status. 150 long feathers, all marked with the famous eye spots, are flawlessly arranged like a modern piece of art. Cobalt blue feathers around his neck and on his head, and an artistically elaborated crown complete the look. His appearance speaks for itself. The female is more into a simpler look. After all, she is not the one who has to make an impression. She can decide whose tail feathers she likes best. These two have found each other. The competitor's looks couldn't convince her. Hopefully the next lady will give him a chance. His stunning tail feathers will soon shed. In a few weeks, only the body feathers will remain. Orlik Castle lies 80 kilometers before Prague. Right here, the city of Stakov was drowned by floods when the Valdava was dammed to create Lake Orlik. The sunken city is today a popular scuba diving site. The divers go as deep as 60 meters using special equipment and mixed gas. The water is murky due to the many suspended solids. It's difficult for the divers to see far. A diving shot leads them to the underwater city. After five meters, it is pitch dark. 50 meters deep down, the church tower suddenly appears. Then the nave with its arched windows. The divers are floating between the sunken buildings and sometimes they also take a look inside. The scuba tank, filled with mixed gas, lasts one and a half hours. When the breathing gas supply is depleted, the divers must head back to the surface. In this region, water has always been both a blessing and a curse. In the past, the Valdiva easily burst its banks, dragging away fertile soil and destroying houses. Since the reservoirs and cascades were built, the worst could be prevented. But the Valdiva is still far from being tamed. It's raining at Lake Orlik, and nature is taking it all in. After waiting patiently in its set, the badger is now off to track down some slugs and beetles. The damp moss of coniferous forests is a perfect habitat for fire salamanders. Their skin is covered with poison glands, and the bright color signals to the badger that it should better be careful. Badgers have been proven to use the same residence for up to 40 generations. This set here, on the slope of the Valtavar riverbanks, has also been inhabited for quite a while. These wood ants have settled at the entrance of this set. Not the best choice. 
they must have forgotten that badgers love to eat larvae. While the adult badger is busy stuffing its stomach with ants, the cubs have better things to do. A badger's set is always a multi-generational home. The old and wise are responsible for the lively young, but it is not always easy to keep up with them. When things get dangerous, it's time to leave. Wild boars are rarely sighted during daytime. They are one of the most cautious animals and only feel safe in the dark. The forests around Lake Orlick provide excellent shelter. This one here also leads a secret life. Today, lynxes depend on the help of humans for their survival. But humans and civilization are also their biggest threat. Out of a litter of four to six cubs, only a few survive. Especially traffic poses a great risk to young lynxes. The female only stays with her offspring for about a year. After that, they need to find an own territory. Lynxes thrive in woods and swamps. The forests around Lake Orlick provide an ideal habitat for them. Lake Orlik ends at the dam of Olitska Sheshrada, near the city of Tinnad Vlatovo. From there, the Vltava continues to flow 91 meters below the crown of the dam. It has now become a wide river, comfortably stretching in its bed. Again, the river forms beautiful meanders, just like it did in its upper and middle course. Near one of these meanders, we're running into one of Valtavar's residents again, the European ground squirrel. A mowed or grazed meadow is the perfect place to live. Of course, the soil must be soft and sandy. The old riverbed of the Valtava offers all these advantages. Eating and burrowing, these are the main activities of the ground squirrel. It also needs several holes to hide in. Since these little animals can leave quite a mess on the ground, they used to be hunted. These times seem to be over now, as they are reclaiming more and more land. Sweet flowers, sour grasses, and a little protein snack every now and then make the squirrel happy. Besides, they also help gain weight. But there is also a dark side of life. Sometimes the warning call comes too late. Birds of prey are their main threat. Some are still peeking out of the hole. This curiosity could be their undoing.
all clear again. Time to get back to daily business. Next task, grooming under the sun. Of course, they must not forget to say hello to their mother, partner, siblings or friends. In some ways, they're just like us humans. Only a few meanders more, until Bohemia's lifeline, the mother of all rivers, reaches Prague. The Golden City. An architectural masterpiece in every sense. Karlov Most, Charles Bridge, is the oldest preserved bridge over the Valtavar River and one of the oldest stone bridges in Europe. It was built in the 14th century and connects the old town with the lesser town. The latter existed as an independent town until the 18th century. It was known as a city of wealth and palaces. The center of the Golden City is defined by impressive sandstone towers and roofs that shine like gold in the sun. Just like Chesky Krumlov, the city center is listed a UNESCO World Heritage Site. A special species has been living in Prague for many decades, the koipu. Originally native to South America, it was first introduced to Prague by fur farmers. The huge orange teeth are its signature look. The color is caused by iron in the rodents' enamel. Their fur is dense and keeps them warm even in winter. They can therefore be seen at the banks of the Valtava all year round. With their forefeet, they're holding the many treats that visitors offer them. Their hind feet have webbed toes. The light-coated coipus are not albinos. Their fur is the result of breeding. Coipus seem to be perfectly equipped for life in Prague. Thanks to their claws, they can easily pass the often slippery fortified river banks and eat out of the visitors' hands. In Prague, it is actually prohibited to feed coipus in order to stop their uncontrolled population growth. But obviously, the ban hasn't exactly been effective. The largest part of Prague is located in a wide valley of the Valtava. The river itself flows through the city for around 30 kilometers. Behind Prague, it is only a few miles until Mielnik appears on the map. This town is a symbol of grief for many Czechs. It's the place where the Valtava loses its name. Shortly before Mielnik, the Valtavar was divided by human hands. On the right lies the Valtavar Canal. In the center, there's the Valtavar. And on the left is where the Golden River merges with the Elbe River. Many Czechs insist on determining that Bohemia's lifeline doesn't end here. They rather call it a place of unification. Theoretically, the Valtava would be entitled to keep its name until it reaches Hamburg. It is the longer river that carries more water. Yet it was decided otherwise. The Elbe, not the Valtava, was allowed to keep its name. This is how Mielnik became witness to the Valtava's fate. The common journey of both rivers starts here, joined together as one they will flow until they reach the North Sea. The Valtavar is unique. It has inspired countless artists. 
major cities were built along its banks. The Valtavar is wild. Humans have repeatedly tried to tame the river, and yet its character remained. It is still meandering through meadows and forests. Alongside the riverbanks, nature is thriving. But the Valtavar holds one more surprise. In the Bohemian forest, at an altitude of 1,315 meters, the Valtavar's main headstream starts its journey. It's the source of the warm Valtavar. It doesn't originate in a bog, but between rocks. A coin is sinking to the bottom of a water basin. These rocks were still hidden under snow and ice in spring. Now, they're revealing the real origin of the Golden River. <laughs>